Good morning, everyone. It's a great privilege for me to be with you all uh, this Sunday, the first Sunday of 2021. Uh, it's a shame that we cannot be together. Uh, we have plans to be together, but the Lord had different plans uh, for us. And please, if you have your Bibles, uh, I will ask you to open in Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. The Word of God says in Matthew, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet, when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the doubt. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowns in parables. He didn't say anything to them without using a parable. So it was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. It is the word of God. 2020, 2020 has been probably the hardest year in recent times in Western society. Many of us have lost relatives and friends, jobs, finances. The world is grieving in pain, looking for a hope which cannot be found nowhere else but in Christ Jesus. And I think that this passage that we will study this morning is a great consolation and a great reminder for us in times of uncertainty and in times of pain and in times of suffering, that the kingdom of God will grow because Christ Jesus will extend his kingdom. And he is still a sovereign God who is in control of everything that happens in this world. One of my favorite theologians is Andrew Fuller. He was a Baptist pastor in the late 18th century in England. He was the founder of the London Baptist Missionary Society, uh, which sent William Carey to India in 1793, just over 200 years ago. Now, something interesting. When William Carey went to India at the beginning of the 19th century, only 1% of the population of evangelical Christians live in non-Western countries, only 1%. Now, 200 years later, in 2016, around 90% of the population of evangelical Christians live in non-Western countries. How is that that the population of Christians have grown so much over the last 200 years, particularly in non-Western countries, from being 1% of the total to be almost 90%. Because of the growth of the kingdom is hidden, but is powerful and certain. The kingdom of God has been growing over the last 200 years in many ways that we haven't even realized in the midst of suffering, in the midst of war, in the midst of poverty, but the kingdom of God has been extended over the last 200 years and is extending and growing today and will keep growing tomorrow in spite of everything that we are looking around us. And we can be certain about it, and we can find great consolation on this truth. Many times you cannot see what the Lord is doing around the world. We see so much violence and suffering. We share the gospel with people, and nothing happens. You pray for your friends and family, and it thinks that nothing happened. Don't be discouraged. The growth of the kingdom may not be visible to the eyes, 
like this parable teaches us, is hidden, but is certain. Now, this morning I would like to talk about what is called the parables of the kingdom uh, in Matthew chapter 13. And I would like to start speaking a little bit about this, about what is the purpose of these parables uh, that sometimes are misunderstood uh, parables. Now, this parable belongs to a sexual section called the parables of the kingdom. These parables are repeated with a slightly different emphasis in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the purpose is to explain different characteristics of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is perhaps the most important theme in the Bible. All of the themes in Scripture, including the covenants of God and the gospel itself, is related are related to the theme of the kingdom. For instance, for instance, what is the gospel? Mark uh, begins his gospel uh, telling us the next thing in Mark chapter one verse fifteen. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the gospel. <laughs> now, you see how Mark connects the good news of the gospel to the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is a theme that permeates the whole of scripture and all the other themes, including the gospel, are related to the kingdom of God. This is why it's so important to have a good understanding about the kingdom of God and what these parables are talking about, because they are talking about some characteristics of the kingdom of God, a very important theme. Now, before explaining the meaning of these two parables in Matthew chapter 13, I would like to say, what are these parables not talking about? What is not the meaning of these parables? It's important to sometimes to understand something. It's very important to define what that is not about, what it's not talking about. Now, these parables are not talking about a political realm where the government has control over the church. They are not talking about a religious state and they are not exactly primarily talking about the church, neither. The church is the means by which the kingdom of God is announced and the church by witness of the kingdom. But the church and the kingdom are different from each other, although they are closely related. The church can suffer persecution, but the kingdom of God can be growing stronger and stronger. Now, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is God's kingly rule. It's the sphere on which God reigns, on which his sovereign power and will are exercised, and his influence is exercised, exercised through several means, but particularly through the church. Hence, the kingdom of God is already with us and within us. It has been inaugurated in the first coming of Jesus, but it will be consummated in his second coming. Hence, these parables tell us something about the time on which we are living, the time between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And something that we must understand about the kingdom of God and these parables is that the kingdom of God is primarily understood in its scriptures as power. Power of God. Now, when I read the newspapers or watch the news about the way in which they refer to Christianity or the kingdom of God, they usually speak about it about a set of belief or theology, like the kingdom of God, the people of the kingdom of God or Christianity, they believe this and they believe that, da, 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 and that is correct. Yes, I am a Christian because I believe this and I believe that. The kingdom of God is theologically based on truth. That is totally certain. However, listen to the way in which Paul describes the kingdom of God. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, he says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but, but of power. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, For I am not resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith not may not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. In Paul's mind, the kingdom of God is not primarily a theological or philosophical idea. Although it's highly theological in content, the kingdom of God is primarily the expression of God's power. Power to live a life that pleases God. Power to defeat sin. Power in the Holy Spirit to evangelize. Power to bring people from darkness to light. Power to defeat Satan. Power to live a life that pleases God. Power to live a life of holiness. Power to change people's heart. The kingdom of God is primarily about power because God is a powerful God. Now, there are two parables in this passage of Scripture. And I would like to explain the first one of them. The parable of the mustard seed. The parable of the mustard seed in verse 31 and 32. The emphasis is on the growing, the growing size of the kingdom of God. Now, let's make a comparison between these two parables. The first parable here, the parable of the seed, and the second one, the parable of the um, leaven, uh, bread, the first parable is talking or is related to the size of the kingdom. And the second one is related to the growth in its influence. In every case, the kingdom begins, or the beginnings of the kingdom are very small. But the point is that they will grow beyond measure. These two parables are taken from everyday life in Jewish culture. However, the first one is related to the work of a man in a field, the seed. Whereas the second one is related to the work of a woman at home, the bread. The Lord wanted both men and women, everyone, to understand his teaching about the kingdom of God. And the fact that the parable is repeated is a, is a way to emphasize its meaning. That's a Hebrew way to emphasize something. When we want to emphasize something, we use bold letters or capital letters. When a Jewish wanted to emphasize something, he repeated the same thing in a slightly different ways. It's called a repetition. Now, what is Jesus saying here is pay attention because it's, this is very important. I am emphasizing this because it's very important. Pay attention to this. Now, in verse 31, he's talking about the parable of the mustard seed. And the important thing that we need to realize about this parable is that the power is in the nature of the seed, not in the size of the seed. And that is why the law is emphasizing that the mustard seed is small, weak, Tiny, because he wants to emphasize that the kingdom may look small, weak, and tiny, but the power of it is not in its size, but in its nature. The mustard seed was used as a proverb in ancient Jewish culture for its smallness. The average size of a mustard seed is one millimeter, tiny. I mean, if you have one centimeter, divided that between 10, and you have a mustard seed. You can barely see it when you have it in your hand. It was the smallest seed 
known in Jewish agriculture. The law is emphasizing how tiny, weak, and small was the beginning of the kingdom of God and how huge it was going to be in the future. How does something so small can produce something so big? How does a bunch of frightened disciples after the death of the Messiah in a corner of Rome, how is that possible that that tiny religion has become the greatest religion in the world and the greatest influence in Western society through the centuries? Because the power doesn't rely on its people. The Power relies on the message of the kingdom, which is done by God himself. The seed is extremely powerful because it's the gospel itself, which is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who lives, the Jew first and the Gentile too. Now, that is why it's not important the amount of faith you have. But the nature of the faith. Now, what, what, what do I mean by this? Is you can have faith in a rock, you can have faith in a tree, and you can have a, you can have a lot of faith in a rock, but it's useless. It's not the amount of faith that you have that saves you. It's the object of your faith that saves you. It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the right type of faith, and it's Christ who saves you. Know the amount of your faith, but the object of your faith. Even the smallest seed of the kingdom of God is powerful. Even the smallest faith, because it comes from God and can overcome all the kingdoms of this world. Now listen to what the Lord Jesus says in Matthew 17, 20. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be possible for you. People now emphasize all kinds of faith. They say, you ought to have faith in yourself. You ought to have faith that you can do it. You ought to have a lot of faith. And you understand that, but from a biblical point of view, it's totally wrong. It doesn't matter that you have a million tons of faith in yourself. It won't change absolutely nothing. You can have all faith that you want in a saint or in Mary or whatever, and it's not helpful at all. But a tiny amount of faith, like a mustard seed, that is true in its nature, place on Christ Jesus is extremely powerful because Christ Jesus is extremely powerful. Now, what is this seed that is talking in this parable? Now, the whole of the scriptures are full of references to the meaning of the seed. And let me read you one verse. There are many verses, but let me read you just one verse about the seed. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Now, the scriptures are clear. The seed is the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel through the preaching of the word, the new birth, the new life in Christ, working in us and within us, and from us to the whole of the world. That is the power of the gospel, the power of the seed of the gospel. Now, first, some things related to this parable is like the Lord Jesus Christ uses the word tree in Matthew. Now, why would he use the word tree? And this is an important reference. Now, the word tree wouldn't, would not be the, no, the normal word that you will use to describe a mustard tree. You will probably use the word plant or bush. 
When you read the same account of the parable in Mark, for instance, Mark chapter 4, verse 30, Mark doesn't use the word three. And now Mark was probably written before Matthew. And when you read the different accounts of these parables in the synoptic gospel, namely Luke and Mark, no one of them uses the word three. It's only Matthew who uses the word three. Why? Now, why do the others have the missing word and why Matthew includes the word three? Most commentators say that Matthew did this intentionally. He had an agenda to include the word three in relationship to a mustard plant. Now, the mustard plant was not that big. It was probably eight to ten feet. They wouldn't describe it normally as a tree, but Matthew used the word tree. Why? I think Matthew wanted to make a connection between this parable and the Old Testament teaching in relationship to the kingdom of God. The Old Testament describes the kingdom of God as a tree. Now, particularly in several passages, but let me mention a couple of them. In Ezekiel chapter 17, Ezekiel chapter 31, Psalm 104, and Daniel chapter 4, the kingdom of God is described as a tree. Now, why? Now, now the image of a big tree is used in the Old Testament to refer to a big kingdom. Sometimes it was used in relationship to Persia, the greatest kingdom in Daniel's time. However, it's normally referred to the kingdom of God. And when it's used in relationship to birds, the reference in the Old Testament was, in every case, to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. Let me read you Ezekiel 17.23. It says, On the mountain heights of Israel I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. Ezekiel is basically saying that the kingdom of God one day will be so big that it will include people from every nation. Like a huge, massive tree has birds from all kinds. Likewise, the kingdom of God one day will be so big that it will include people from all nationalities, ethnicities, and languages. And all of them are going to be united as one big family in Christ. Now, I don't know if you have ever had the opportunity to see a huge tree. I have. I've crossed the Amazon three times uh, in missionary trips, preaching the gospel and teaching to pastors in the Amazon River. And in one of the trips, trips that I went to that I crossed the Amazon when I was younger, I saw a kapop tree. Now, Kapop tree is the biggest tree in the Amazon. It's 80 meters tall. 80 meters tall. It produces at any time of the year, every day, it has at the same time 500 fruits. And each one of its fruits contains 200 tiny seeds. That is, 10,000 seeds at any given time. These three normally live around of 800 to 1,000 years. And there are thousands and thousands of birds in it. It's a huge tree. But it began from a very, very tiny seed that with time grows to be massive. How many of you are ethnically Jews? Are you a Jew? I mean, ethnically Jew? I am not, and probably you are not, neither. We are non-Jewish people. We are Gentiles. We are Christians in the kingdom of God. Birds that live in that tree. We live under a particular set of ethics 
values and characteristics that distinguishes us from the wider culture around us. And people see us, the birds in that tree, the way we see life, the way we treat each other, the way we use our money, the way we conduct our marriages. And they see that there is a difference between us and them. They ought to, at least, if we are real Christians. Because we have been inserted. We are like birds in that tree. Now, something that we must pay attention also to this parable is that there is continuity in the growth of the kingdom. There is continuity or similarities between a small seed and a big tree, between a leaf, a branch, and a tree. All of them are part of the same tree. They are not the same. They are different in size, shape, and color. But all of them share the same nature of the tree. A massive tree and a small seed are very different, but they still share the same nature. Likewise, in the kingdom of God, the church today is not the same as 2,000 years ago. It has changed a lot, and there are a lot of differences. A branch of the tree in South Korea doesn't look exactly the same as the branch of the tree in the United States, or in Peru, or in Africa, or in Russia, or in Ireland. They may look as like different, different color, different shape, different size, but we are all part of the same tree, the kingdom of God that is growing and expanding around the world and extending its branches, even though we may not see clearly with our, with our eyes and in our life. Time. Maybe my grandchildren or my great grandchildren may see a much, much, much bigger tree of the kingdom in Ireland. But the fact that the kingdom is small here and the tree is small here doesn't mean that in 200 years from now it won't be a big tree. Look at Peru, where I come from. 40 years ago, the population of evangelical Christians was almost 0%, 0.1%. Nowadays, it's more than 13. It just grow. It may happen the same here. The Lord knows. But the kingdom of God will grow. It may take time. It may take hundreds of years, thousands. But the Lord is extending his kingdom because he is the king of it. The second parable, more briefly, is the parable of the leaven dough, the growing of the influence of the kingdom. The Lord is speaking about Jesus here. Now, Jesus is a symbol in the Old Testament used for influence. Sometimes Jesus is used uh, in a bad way, and sometimes it's used in a good way. But the main point of Jesus is influence. Sometimes it's used in a bad way when it's talking about, for instance, the Pharisees. A little bit of bad teaching by the Pharisees, the Lord says, can contaminate the whole people of Israel. And sometimes it's used in a positive sense. For instance, in relationship to the offering that the people of God brought in the Old Testament to God. Um, the reference is in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Now, the Lord compares the kingdom of God in this way, to Jesus in this way, having a positive influence that at the beginning looks quite unimpressive, but it will have an effect that is out of proportion with its beginning. The idea is the hidden growth of the kingdom is hidden to the eyes. You cannot see it with your senses. You cannot see that it's growing, it's hidden, it's inside it. Now, in first century Judaism, uh, they cook bread at home. Uh, they didn't have super value uh, or Aldi. <laughs> they actually made their own bread. So they knew what they were talking about. Jesus was talking about something that they did every day. Every family would go, will get what he was talking about. Now he's talking a lot of Jesus and a lot of uh, dough here. He in the in, He's speaking about uh, a round of 
50 kilograms of gold. It depends on the translation you are using, NIV or ESB. Uh, in the original, it's, it's talking about three satons of uh, gold, which approximately was 50 kilograms, but it depends how we measure that quantity. The point is that it's a lot of uh, G's and a lot of gold. That's the whole point. It was enough to feed around of 150 to 200 people. It was not the kind of dough that you would prepare for your house, but more for selling or for a big celebration. It's talking about a huge amount of dough. Now, the word that is translated there for mix, the women that mix the G's in the mass, in the original Greek, is the word height. It says that the women, the women, high the gist inside the door. And what is the point here? The point is of the influence of the growth that the gist produced in the dot, in the mouth, that is hidden to the eyes. It's not obvious to the eyes, but it's certain and present. The point of the mustard seed was that the growth of the kingdom is slow. It takes time, but it grows big. That was the first point of the first parable, a slowness. The point of the second parable is hidden. It's high to the eyes. We cannot see, but it's doing, it's growing. It will. Now, imagine this. Imagine that I have this massive amount of dough and I put it in my fridge and I put the G's overnight and I go next day, I open it, I am expecting to find a massive growth, but I open my fridge and it hasn't grown. Hmm. Maybe I think, oh, maybe it requires a little bit more time. So I put more G's on the dough and I leave it there for another six hours. And then I go back. I'll go back to it. I open the fridge and it still hasn't growth at all. There is no growth. Maybe I think mm, I need to put a little bit more perhaps and wait a bit longer. So I put a lot more G's and I close it and I wait for another 24 hours. And I go the next day and it still hasn't growth an inch. Now, I don't know you, but I would probably get very annoyed and say, this G's is rubbish. <laughs> they have actually, it's probably not even G's, I don't know why they have sell me in this market or whatever. It's actually rubbish. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's not producing growth. I will just throw that G's away. The gospel is not a useless G's. If the power, it is the power of God for salvation. And if this Jesus, this power of God, is not producing growth in you or in the church, and I'm not talking about numerical growth necessarily, but growth in holiness, in repentance, in faith, in this new year, if you are not actively mortifying sin in your life, if you live your life every day, every week, without care for the kingdom of God, without care for others, without care for your soul, probably it is because you don't have the Jesus of God, the Jesus of the gospel in you. Probably you may come to church and you may have heard the gospel, but you haven't been born again. There is no growth. Now, I'm not talking that someone becomes a Christian and then next day will be, oh, I, I'm fully mature. No, <laughs> we have said that the kingdom grows slowly and is hidden. And likewise in ourselves, it takes time for us to grow in the gospel, to grow in maturity, to grow in the Christian faith. But if you don't see any change in your life, if there is no desire to be with Christ, if there is no difference in the way in which you use your money and the way in which a non-Christian will use his money, if there is no difference in the way in which you live your life, the way you administer your time, the way, the way in which you live 
your private habits when no one is looking at you? If it's the same as in anyone else in this world, then probably you need to repent today. Or probably you are not even a Christian. You don't know God, although you may claim to know him. The power of the Jesus, the truly power of the gospel, is powerful. Because it's the nature of it, not the amount of it. Now, perhaps you may feel discouraged this morning. You may not see growth in your life. You may not see, see growth in the church. You are in the midst of a dark night. And you don't see what's going on. And that is right. We will not. We will not see with our eyes. That's the whole point of the parable. Be encouraged. Because although we may not see with our eyes, is hidden, is powerful, is doing it. The Lord is doing something behind the curtains. He is extending his kingdom. He's working in your life. He's working in the life of people around you. John Newton, the famous evangelist who fought to abolish slavery in England, when he was old, he was losing all his memory. And then he said, There are a lot of things which I cannot remember anymore, but there are two things I still remember, that I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. Oh, that we may remember this every day in our life. Oh, Christian, be encouraged by this. Keep fighting sin. Do not let him live. Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. There is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. He who began the good work in you will complete it unto the day of Christ. Keep working. Keep planting the good seed. It will grow. It will. You, we, we may not see it, but the Lord is working. Now, just as a way of conclusion, let me... Uh, summarize we've learned what we have learned today first one we said that the kingdom the influence of the kingdom is hidden keep sharing the gospel keep praying keep persevering we must we must announce the gospel with our words and deeds and the law will hold us accountable for what we did and what we said and finally, the kingdom of God will win. We may not see with our eyes. We may have to wait until the resurrection of the flesh. That is the greatest hope of the Christian. I try to live my life in the light of the day which is coming, the day of the resurrection, when we will see fully the harvest of all of our efforts, nothing can, would, or could stop the growth of the gospel. No poverty or persecution or human failures. The gates of Hades will not prevail against the kingdom. Nothing will stop the growth of the gospel in the world. One day, the Great Commission will be the great fulfillment. One day, that tiny seed of mustard will become the biggest tree of all. One day, the law will rule and reign, and every knee will bow down in front of him and confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. Are you doing your part on it? Is the Lord using you? Is the Lord using your church? Is the Lord using your family? Or is he using and will use someone else? Remember William Carey when he went to India. There was almost no believers there. And I remember when my grandmother was young, 40 years ago, when people started to preach the gospel in Peru, there were no believers. And now look at the growth there. And look at the growth in other parts of the world. And even in Ireland, how it's growing. And it will grow. 
be encouraged today in the midst of all that we are going is going around us all this madness that we see around us suffering disease virus close your eyes for a second and look up look at the one who is sitting on his throne and conducting everything in this world and take courage in this 2021 that we may remember this truth of God, Christ, and the kingdom every day and take courage on you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may He, may he shine His face on you today. God bless you.